the Bill of Savoie of 1929 and in Poissy, just outside of Paris, represents the pinnacle achievement of Le Corbusier's early purist villas. The main body of the house, the Piano Nobile, is raised on piers and for the first time is expressed fully in the round, in concert with its pastoral setting. For the first time fully outside the dense urban fabric of Paris. It is also paradoxically a complex embrace and simultaneous disambiguation of the historic weight of Greco-Roman classicism. Colin Rowe and his seminal Mathematics of the Ideal Villa adroitly implies how Le Corbusier seems to have taken Andrea Palladio's Villa Foscari, or La Malcontenta, and the Parthenon as expi explicit generative ideas for the two pastoral respective villas. But what he does not seem to convey is the simultaneous refutation of classicism itself, but that's a different lecture. The main volume of the Villa Savoie is expressed as an elemental squashed cube with a near continuous horizontal window around all four sides. The inhabited rooftop and carved courtyard within the house volume are perhaps the most satisfying and pleasingly enigmatic of all of the free plans of this period, the 1920s. The ground floor of the house is shaped to suggest and allow an automobile to enter and turn under the house in what can perhaps best be described as a sublime and poignant act of poetic functionalism. The house inverts traditional stasis of a courtyard by having a series of ramps at its core, suggesting modern movement. But perhaps most enigmatic and poetic of all is the enormous billowing rooftop sculpture that complements the more analytical two levels below it and imparts a sense of movement and directionality. Luc Cabousier attributed a nominal function to this curved wall by referring to it as a solarium. But as I've said in Lecture 1, the introduction, this essay is not so much an analysis of why we have come to see the Villa Savoie as the exceptionally important and influential house design that it is. Instead, it is an analysis of the elements of the house designed specifically within this second language, our new low language, and intended to be witty. We know that Le Corbusier saw the design as an unusually important and transcendent one while it was still on the drawing boards. It was, in his words, on the way to becoming, quote, a complete and successful work, end quote. I will use biographical evidence and a straightforward formal analysis of the design drawings of the Villa Savoie to argue that perhaps he felt a compulsion to encode into the architectural bones of the villa itself a record of how uniquely effortless and fluid the design process of this masterwork had been, the birthing, as he may have referred to it. Le Corbusier confirms his state of mind some 30 years later by the following quote, which he inscribed in a copy of his Ourve Complete that he gave to the mayor of Poissy in 1960. He writes, quote, Here then is the villa, born in 1929, it was happy in its limpid clarity, so was I. Thirty years have passed, years heavy with hair-raising struggles." End quote. In his comprehensive analysis of the design process of the Villa Savoie, Tim Benton reads the design of the Villa Savoie as being the product of an uncharacteristically easy birth, the almost automatic expression of the synthesis of ten years' research. By comparison, Benton portrays the design development of the Villa Stein two years previous to Savoie as having been far more tortured and circuitous. And it is to the Villa Stein that I will first look to build an evidential case for the presence of concealed and subversive and simultaneously deeply personal wit. Luc Cabousier was hired by the husband and wife Michael and Sarah Stein in conjunction with Gabrielle de Monsi with whom they were to have a shared living arrangement. The resulting house, located in Garches, just outside of Paris, was completed in 1927. Roe points out that on the rooftop of the Villa Stein, Le Cabousier articulated what appears to be a phallus-shaped room. He writes, quote, And there is also present with him a purely French delight in the more overt aspects of mechanics. 
the little pavilion on the roof at Garsh is at the same time a temple of love and the bridge of a ship, end quote. And we can infer that Rose sees the rooftop temple as a temple of love because of its phallus shape. Here Ro is succumbing to expressing to us, albeit in a fairly veiled way, what he suspects to be a secret and personal composition by Luc Corbusier. In this case, I believe he is quite correct in his supposition that a phallus shape on the rooftop of the Villa Stein was intentional. Colin Rowe also states that the Villa Stein, quote, is imbued with sophisticated and witty allusions. And he, Le Cabousier, alludes to historical references of French Rococo hotel planning influencing Stein's design, end quote. Is Rowe suggesting that Le Cabousier included a phallus on the rooftop of the Villa Stein as a witticism, and that it is in essence a quotation of the infamous Le Doux brothel design from 1973? It might deserve no more than Rowe's passing and obscure reference buried in this essay were it not for the possibility that Le Cabousier can be argued to have gone on to insert another more elaborately delineated phallus on the rooftop of his next major house project, the Villa Savoie. And if there is an equivalent rooftop temple at the Villa Savoie, it is the famous billowing solarium. Other scholars have rightfully emphasized the curved shape of the Villa Savoie Solarium as a sensuous and organic complement to the more geometric and Cartesian delineation of the walls on the floors below, and a precursor to the more fluid shapes and other stylistic organic changes to come in his apparent reinvention after the war. A stark contrast of sorts between compositions of the right brain and the left brain in immediate proximity. The, the very specific and final geometric delineation of the solarium came about when Madame Savoie requested the removal of the rooftop master bedroom suite, at which point the former random curves and squiggles on the rooftop turned into the taut and highly specific curves and jogs of the final solarium design we have all come to know. I remember over the decades visually poring over the solarium's highly specific plan. It is asymmetrical. The curves are both random and exceedingly specific at the same time. One has the radius of a, a circle. The other is an ellipse of sorts. And the chimney, oh, the chimney. It is part of the wall of the solarium, but miraculously detached. Brilliant. But I now suggest this curious shape of the solarium can be read another way, as another rooftop phallus. But instead of representing the phallus as a planimetric diagram, as in the Ledoux brothel design, Le Corbusier seems to have wittily portrayed a side view or elevation of the self-same phallus. In this mode of interpretation, the larger left curve can be said to represent the testicles, and the smaller curve with the sharp jog on the right would represent the distinctive phallus head represented in profile, again, not in plan. To say that Luc Corbusier represented a phallus on the rooftop of the Villa Savoie is arguably no less radical than Rowe's previous interpretation of a rooftop phallus at the Villa Stein. I have simply used more straightforward descriptors. And indeed, if wit is still the operable paradigm in which the Savoie phallus is to be interpreted, it can be said to be an even more sophisticated act of wit in this demonstrable one-upping of the original Ledoux quotation by representing the phallus in side view or elevation, um, schoolboy sophistication. He has thus hidden it for us to discover. Furthermore, in terms of the narrative of this witticism, the curious detached chimney can be said to add an even more, let us say, piquant quality by possibly suggesting the erect phallus at its very moment or of emission or somewhat after. While Le Corbusier may have been the first architect to wittily represent a phallus in elevation within a work of architecture, he wouldn't be the last. About 50 or so uh, years later, Arata Isozaki, the dawn of the postmodern movement, appears to have also depicted the phallus in profile. Here perhaps a bit more naturally with a looser scrotum. Yes, this is cutting edge historical analysis, folks. 
but an elaboration on the many parallels with the second language of Le Corbusier's architecture and the postmodern movement um, must be the subject of another analysis. Or you can just read all of Charles Jinks's works. While the elements of wit that Rowe alludes to in the Villa Stein are readily apparent, such as the rooftop homage to Ledoux, the inverted airplane wing entry canopy, and abrupt symmetrical juxtaposition of the main entrance door against a humble garage door, the Villa Savoie has generally been associated with more sincere and earnest intentions. Most notably, Le Corbusier included a freestanding porcelain sink in the downstairs entry vestibule, and it has widely been seen to have almost religious overtones, being analogous to uh, a baptismal font or holy water vessel at the entry of a Christian church. A bit of deep quasi-religious earnestness for someone generally noted to be an atheist or a naturist. This notion of the house as sacred temple suggests a deep earnestness which is about as far away from sardonic wit as could be. How might we interpret this inclusion of phalluses in Le Corbusier's two most important residences of the 1920s other than the broad categorization of them as examples of wit and outright subversion? It may be tempting to simply dismiss the phallic interpretation or go no further in any analysis because of the immensely uncomfortable and unusual territory for an architectural historian. How can a house as famous as the Villa Savoie seem to contain both the heights of earnestness and almost nihilism? Watch my introduction lecture one for a larger discussion of this point. Now, at this point in the lecture, you're of course free to simply dismiss the rooftop phallus as impossible or tentatively, tentatively hold it at arm's length as an example of tongue-in-cheek schoolboy wit. In which case, thanks for watching, I say adieu. But as a matter of following the historical record where it leads, I believe we can actually go quite a bit further in this rooftop phallus analysis. And I think you'll quickly see precisely why Le Corbusier's studies has generally not gone down this road a general unwillingness to enter into the rather complex and very uncomfortable psyche of Charles Jean Ray. Perhaps it's one thing to consider the sexuality of an artist like, say, Salvador Dali as seminal to the work. You know what you're getting into when you choose to study his work. But with Luc Cabousier, many of us first fall in love with the deeply satisfying and complex nature of his projects at a formal and intellectual level. We didn't bargain for the sexuality bit. It so happens that when we delve into Le Corbusier's biography, and most especially Nicola, Nicholas Fox Weber's rather excellent and exhaustive 2006 accounting of his, in his Le Corbusier A Life, and gain a deeper understanding of the outsized importance that Le Corbusier's sexuality played in his understanding of his creativity and definition of self, we can see perhaps a more nuanced and complex understanding of why he might have chosen the particular narrative of a phallus for his rooftop temple at the Villa Savoie. I suggest a case can be made that it was a reflection of his own happiness and state of limpid clarity, as he said. An idea which may indeed have begun as witticism at the Villa Stein two years earlier seems to have evolved into a far more personal and earnest meaning with an unexpectedly complex narrative, and it likely served as a template for future projects. A full analysis of Luc Corbusier's sexuality is of course beyond my capacities, or this manuscript, but we can piece together a fairly accurate sketch of his basic life experiences and worldview in this regard by reviewing his many correspondences and reflections on the topic. He was simply not shy about discussing his sexual experiences at length to others, even to his rather modest parents. Again, this is what makes Nicholas Fox Weber's deep and excellent dive into Charles Jean Ray and later Le Corbusier's biography so cringeworthy at times. At a historical level, we can see that he was a fairly late bloomer in terms of his sexual confidence and experience. In his earlier years, he appears to have seen himself 
as largely homely and incapable of having a close relationship with a woman. He had bouts of depression and self-doubt that intermixed with a deep frustration and ongoing frustrating desire for sexual fulfillment. Nicholas Fox Weber writes, quote, he loathed his own appearance, linking it with his unfulfilled craving for women. Good God, yet I could, if I really wanted to, eventually consider some young lady inexpressibly lovely. Hear me out. In my entire life as a student, I cohabitated with cats, always above the gutter and never below it. The window was usually no more than a peephole, and when in the shadows the mirror afforded a reflection, I saw everything in that mirror. I couldn't believe it, but I went on looking. I saw rickety legs and huge red dangling paws swollen with disenchantment, a nose straight on which seemed to define the creature underneath, a wrinkled forehead, crestfallen coiffure, and a lot of skin and bones an unhealthy complexion, end quote. At another point, Fox Weber writes that uh, Charles Genere envied an acquaintance who had a mistress who is a real woman. He's beyond me, says Genere. I'm isolated, wounded. I suffer. I see the irony, the grotesquerie of life. I'd like to experience its beauty, its energy, along with this springtime, this joy, this living in spite of everything. How I long to flowering." End quote. His early sexual experiences appear to have been with prostitutes. He had deeply conflicted feelings about them. Simultaneously, he had intense desires and repulsions of them. However, we can see that this inherent sexual insecurity was to begin to change after he met Yvonne Gallus in Paris around 1919. She was to be the great love of his life. They moved in together in 1922 and married in 1930. Yvonne seems to have been Le Cabousier's first long-term sexual and romantic friendship, and she seems to have met his ideals of beauty. Yvonne Gallus has proved an immense conundrum in the field of Carbusian studies, as she was ostensibly very much the opposite of everything he stood for, his cerebral and public persona. She was bawdy and crude, whereas Le Cabousier's uh, constructed image was more of the aloof, sonorous, and cerebral master. She hated any discussions of architecture. The rather extensive and underappreciated significance of Yvonne in the whole Rabelaisian sphere of Le Cabousier's architecture and ideology will be explored in more detail in future chapters. This is all to say that by the end of the 1920s, with a busy office and international reputation, and perhaps a more secure grasp on his sexuality and self-confidence, he was very much a different man. He said, quote, It so happens today that I exist much more rapidly and more powerful than I would ever have thought. I have created my identity on my own foundations, on my own terms. End quote. Gone was the self-deprecatory pseudonym Paul Ballard, the name he referred to himself to in letters as the uninitiated hick from the provinces. Present now was Le Corbusier, the Corbusier, both a prophet of modernism and man worthy of being in the sun. To this point, we know that Le Corbusier projected a very deep link between his sexuality and his creativity. Just as he seemed to have endured periods of artistic impotence, so too did he appear to have experienced real physical impotence in his sexual life. Jean Ray prized sexual potency as a mark of greatness, and Fox Weber perceptively said about him, quote, The act of love and the making of buildings were inextricably linked in Charles Edouard Jean Ray's mind. Going to brothels and realizing architecture required similar determination. The challenge was to get from the fantasy stage to efficacy. To him, sexual efficacy was akin to creative efficacy, and his struggles with impotence in both seem to have pained him deeply. Fox Weber states that Jean Ray prized sexual potency as a mark of greatness. Quote, to have or not to have an erection. He who gets hard and stays 
with it is a man capable of strength, still a beast deserving to live in the sun. Swiss men, he claimed, were eunuchs, but now he had left their neutered land behind. End quote. Fox Weber states that sex was often a struggle for him. Quote, the act of love is rather complicated to perform. It requires special circumstances. I no longer manage to have my old magnificent erection and I fall back in a fatally oriental impulse on visions of Spanish fly, end quote. Spanish fly being the, an aphrodisiac. He also writes, uh, Le Corbusier also writes, Octave's irony, he knows my sickness, impotence he's referring to, and laughs at it, end quote. One of the more specific and curious details of Le Corbusier's linkage of his sexual performance with his creative life was his belief that the act of a nocturnal emission, a wet dream, and sexual fulfillment in that dream was akin to the highest creative act. Like this letter from Jean Array, as summarized by Fox Weber, quote, from darkness of this condition flung me into an abyss, and now I see white. In a manic upswing, he wrote, I'm determined to celebrate rather than deny pleasure. He compared his responses to art and music to his sexual emissions when he was sleeping. His aesthetic reactions resembled the effervescence of carnal dreams, end quote. We cannot definitively say that the rooftop ejaculating phallus at the Villa Savoie was intended to represent an erotic dream state. However, there is much additional evidence in the uh, succeeding chapters that I will propose especially in my analysis of the Taurus painting series. How deeply significant the narrative of sexual dreams may have been for him will be the subject of that lecture. Also, why bouts of impotence would be painful, would be a painful experience for Luc Corbusier is probably not hard to imagine. It's the inverse of proud, manly, virile sexual performance, after all. Perhaps less easy for many of us to picture is the pain Le Corbusier felt when struggling to create a work of architecture. We do not often think of architects struggling with the almost cliché of artistic pains, but it is quite clear from the historical record that Le Corbusier very much did. In later years, Le Corbusier came to expound and he perhaps even romanticized the difficulties and pain of painting. He called these l'angoisse de la création the pains of creation. When we speak generally of artistic pains, we are perhaps reminded of the fairly romantic and even cliche notion of the tortured genius artist, Vincent van Gogh being perhaps the most prominent. The notion of artistic pain as a necessary component of greatness is perhaps a fairly tired convention. When an accountant is depressed, it's psychology. When an artist is depressed, it's poetry. For our purposes, the link between depression and creativity in an analysis of Le Corbusier is important only insofar as he viewed the subject as relevant to his life and can be objectively argued that he then, in turn, represented these feelings in his art and architecture. One of the more convincing themes in Fox Weber's biography is the seriality and intensity with which Le Corbusier seems to have had swings from ecstatic joy to despondency. With this prosaic description of artistic angst in mind, let us review quotations that shed light on the presence of pain in Le Corbusier's creative world. He wrote the following about his painting, and this is only one example of many of his ruminations on the subject. He writes, painting is a bitter struggle, terrifying, pitiless, unseen, a duel between the artist and himself. The struggle goes on inside, hidden on the surface. If the artist tells, he is betraying himself. Exclamation point. Everything we know about the depressions and manic highs that Luc Corbusier experienced in his life and how his former associates describe his ups and downs in the Rue de Sèvres office bear this out in his creation of architecture. Jersey Sultan, a young associate in the office for four years after the war, recalled, quote, 
If things did not go too well, if he felt uncertain of his ideas and unhappy with his drawings, then Corbu became jittery and finally said grudgingly, quote, say difficile l'architecture, end quote. Toss the pencil or charcoal stub on the drawing and slink out as if ashamed to abandon the project and me and us in a predicament. During the years with Corbu, I experienced several periods of these pains related to the conceptualization of the incoming projects. Indeed, what struck me as particularly interesting was the permanence of this anguish. One would have expected the intensity of pain to decrease, perhaps even disappear with age and experience. But the truth of the matter is that instead of diminishing, it tended to grow." End quote. Another associate, Andre Waginski, relates similar memories from his time in Luc Corbusier's atelier. Quote, he was hard, even violent sometimes, in a state of inner rage that he tried to control, and yet gentle and even tender. He was gentle because he was strong. He was proud but modest, often self-doubting. He once even called his close collaborator and told him, Am I not making a mistake? Will the inhabitants of the Unité de Habitation at Marseille be happy? Would you like to live in the radiant city? And it was left to that assistant, so tiny in comparison to him, to lift up his spirits." End quote. Le Cabousier was well aware of the expectations that an architect should be far more even-keeled and non-emotional as compared to the other, more phlegmatic disciplines of art. And indeed, when he saw this emotional weakness in others, he tended to use it as a cudgel. He said at one point, quote, These Americans wear their hearts on their sleeve, a ready case for the psychoanalysts of things that are better kept, not said. Alas, the Americans saw me not as an architect, but far worse as a phlegmatic artist, wearing his heart on his sleeve, end quote. This is all to say that inscribing an erect phallus at the moment of effervescence on the rooftop of the Villa Savoie, what Le Corbusier may have been celebrating in part was the effortless design process of this masterwork. And in his personal life, Le Corbusier was to hear on play the role of a confident, attractive ladies' man. While Colin Rowe might be inclined to see the two rooftop phalluses on the Villa Stein and Savoie, as witty rooftop temples of love, it might be equally fitting to read them as figureheads, as one would find in a boat. We have a curiously specific quote from Charles Jeanneret while traveling down the Danube on a large white paddle boat in 1911 on his famous journey to the east. He writes, quote, Were I a fisherman or merchant along its banks, I would religiously sculpt out of wood, somewhat in a Chinese manner, a god whom I would worship. I would set him on the bow of my boat, smiling and gazing out vaguely ahead of him, just as they did in Norman times. My religion, however, would not be one of terror. It would be serene, but above all, full of admiration." End quote. The implied directionality of the Villa Savoie is arguably away from the main entry road. And if Le Corbusier instinctively saw the solarium as a figurehead placed at the front of his vessel to express his own creative efficacy, this is where it would be located. I hypothesize that the Villa Savoie was very much a turning point for Luc Corbusier insofar as he can be argued at this time to have discovered a surreptitious method to insert a fuller, extended personal narrative into his architecture. Significantly, this seems to have occurred only at the very end of the design process. He was attempting to do what architecture, and especially abstract modern architecture, heretofore ostensibly could not do. The attachment of literal and highly personal narratives to an architecture that was considered the height of abstraction. I will continue to argue in the next chapter, the Unité de Habitation, that this urge towards literal representation and narrative was a pattern Le Corbusier seems to have repeated in all of his major architectural works. This piece of his own person, his own psyche, embedded into a masterwork of architecture, came to be a critically important artistic and sculptural component in them. 
Perhaps Le Corbusier even came to feel that any of his masterpieces would not yet be complete until they received a similar secret and deeply personal construction of their own hidden in plain sight. So what does knowing this riddle of the solarium add or detract from our traditional understandings of this still very famous house? Many I suspect will simply dismiss this interpretation as impossible. But the more thoughtful among us who can hold deeply contradictory thoughts in, in our head at the same time, I think we'll be able to layer this additional and uncomfortable personal complexity into the more beautiful and formative aspects of the house as we've come to know them. If this is your first exposure to the house, then by God, go back and do your homework. <laughs> These lectures are not for you. It's not a good introduction. Yes, he wanted us to find it, but a rooftop phallus is the least important thing to know about this masterwork of 20th century architecture. 